Good evening and happy holidays. Welcome to the City Council meeting for Monday, December 18, 2017. We will be, uh, just a quick note, Mayor Allender is not here tonight, so I'll be filling in. I apologize. Um, we'll start with a roll call and determination of quorum. Scott. Drew. Here. Nordstrom. Here. Modric. Here. Solomon. Here. Lewis. Here. Armstrong. Here. Laurenti. Here. Drury, Roberts. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have a, a special invocation tonight. We have uh, the Dakota Choral Union here that are going to uh, sing a nice little thing for us, and then we'll follow that up with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'll rise, and, and if you folks can come on up. I'd like to thank the choir and remind everyone that they are funded in part by the Rapid City Arts Subsidy. Thank you for being here. Very well. Uh, we'll move on to our agenda. Do we have a motion to adopt the agenda or make any changes? 
So moved. We got a motion by Lewis and second by Armstrong. All favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. We'll now uh, go down to uh, the front for awards and recognitions. Thank you. Well, it's an honor tonight to uh, recognize our Veteran of the Month. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about this, this gentleman. Uh, this, just for the record, this, this uh, award is in partnership with the Veterans Coordination Commission, and they're pleased to present the December 2017 Veteran of the Month recognition to Doug Brandt. Doug Brandt enlisted in the Army on April 14, 1970, because of a feeling of moral obligation and a strong family sense of duty. Doug's father, Lloyd Brandt, and five of his brothers all volunteered to enlist in the Marine Corps. And two of Doug's mother's brothers enlisted in the Army during World War II. Uh, the five Brandt brothers fought in the Pacific Theater, and the Lester brothers fought in the European Theater, serving under General Patton. With one uncle killed in combat and one severely wounded in combat, Doug credits these brave men as the inspiration for his decision to serve his country. Doug was sent to Vietnam in October of 1970 and served a tour of duty for 13 months, returning stateside in November of 1971. While in Vietnam, Doug was assigned to the 379th Transportation Company, Long Bin, Republic of Vietnam. The, th the 379th provided food, ammunition, fuel, supplies to units, conducting ground operations at fire bases and fire support bases throughout the central highlands and southern coastal regions of South Vietnam. Doug's duties included operating a medium five ton tractor trailer rig, serving as an M60 machine gunner driver for the convoy commander and providing convoy security as a crew member on a gun truck. And also as a member of the perimeter guard unit manning the perimeter bunkers and perimeter guard towers. Doug received an honorable discharge on April 13, 1976. Doug began volunteering at Fort Meade VA Medical Center in July 2003 and began driving the DAV van in January 2005. To date, he has logged 56,987 miles, volunteered a total of 5,297 hours, and transported 4,352 veterans to medical appointments, including out-of-town appointments in Minneapolis and Omaha. Doug is dedicated to serving his fellow veterans. Doug is thankful for his wife of 37 years, Cheryl Brandt, their four wonderful children, three daughters, all married with families, and a son married and carrying on the family tradition of service with the Air Force's special operations as a pararescue man. Doug also has eight wonderful grandchildren. Doug Brandt is to be commended for his service to his country. His example of service makes him deserving of this honor, and tonight we'd like to extend our gratitude. So would you please welcome Doug Brandt. Also, as a thank you, he, he gets a little mug from the city. It doesn't seem very, very big, but it's nice. Uh, what's really cool is the man salon has offered a free haircut. A certificate too. Uh, maybe a beer trim. We both could use one of those. So I'll give that to you. Give that to you. Did, did you want to say anything? All right. We're going to take some photos. Do you have any family members you want to be in there? All right. We'll come over here and take some.
We have one more award in recognition tonight, the Hit Hero of the Month. This is a great award. In partnership with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and the VA Black Hills Caregiver Support Office, we are pleased to present our Hidden Hero of the Month recognition to Tennille Collins for the month of December. Tennille is the caregiver to her husband, Tech Sergeant John Collins, who served as an Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team Leader. That's a tough job. Uh, Tech Sergeant Collins was injured multiple times during his compact deployments. Sergeant Collins suffers from multiple blast-related mild traumatic brain injuries, PTSD, chronic migraines, memory impairment, and spinal injuries, among others. In September of 2016, one month after Sergeant Collins was medically retired, it was apparent he needed substantial assistance with daily activities. Tennille left her 20-year nursing career to be her husband's caregiver. She took on the responsibilities of setting up appointments, ensuring medications are taken correctly, all household duties, and the list continues. Mrs. Collins takes pride in her new role as a veteran caregiver and feels it is her way to give back to her husband. He sacrificed so much for our family during a 17-year career. Now it's my turn to give back to him, she said. Watching him, every, watching him struggle every day with things that were not an issue a few years ago is hard to watch. She understands the toll that war has taken on her husband and gives support and love to him during the rough patches. Tennille and John are the parents of five children, Ada and Mackenzie, Christian, Hayden, and Rylan, and John's service dog, Boomer, who's with us tonight. Mrs. Collins has been humbly, humbly serving our country as a veteran caregiver with dedication, compassion, and sacrifice, making her an excellent hidden hero of the month. Her service to our veteran community makes her deserving of this honor, and we would like to extend our gratitude. Thank you to Neil Collins, and would you please come up here, everybody. Hey, as, a, as another recognition, Perfect 10 has given her a gift certificate, which is a small token right. of appreciation. Thank but thank you very much, Tineo. Thank you. Did you, you want to say it. anything? Nope. Okay. <laughs> we'll take some few pictures. Right. Did you want your hand? Sure. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Next up on our agenda is a presentation from the Kenyon Lake Senior Citizen Center. Uh, <laughs> you're already clapping? Like I'm pushing buttons without trying to here. Let's get back to where we started. There we go. All right. You should be able to find this presentation in big format uh, in front of you there also. You can follow along there if you want to. My name is Gary Miller, and I represent the uh, Canyon Lake uh, Senior Center. And I've been uh, joined today by a whole bunch of other pickleball players. 
And uh, what I'd like to do is for those people that are pickleball players at Canyon Lake to go ahead and just raise your hand and let them know you're here. We, uh, we play the uh, fastest growing sport in America. It's called pickleball. And uh, if you've never seen it before, this is the accoutrements that we play with. Paddle looks like an overgrown uh, paddle for ping pong. And the ball is uh, plastic. It's a wiffle ball and uh, plastic. So it doesn't go real fast, but it goes fast enough when, when uh, hit by some of the better players. We do have uh, the best player in South Dakota, in my estimation, uh, sitting in the front row tonight, uh, Alvin Tran. And uh, he's, he spends a lot of time teaching the rest of us how the game is supposed to be played. I'm sure you all um, know what the Canyon Lakes Senior Center is all about, uh, where we're located. We've got over 900 members. Right now we've got over 100 people that play pickleball on a regular basis. Pickleball is about a 65-year-old, or started, so it's over 50 years old. It started in about 1965. And it is, according to some people, the fastest growing sport in America. And I'll tell you the reason for that is it's a lot of fun. 2016, they, they thought, think that there's over two and a half million players playing pickleball in the United States alone. It's starting to spread into other countries. Uh, and the, the best guess is that by 2020, we'll have over 20 million people playing pickleball. USAPA, that's the United States Pickleball Association. They keep a database on the internet, so right now, as of this is in early December, over 4,747 places to play. It increases about 80 places per month. That's how fast it's growing. 16,549 courts at that time. This is about a month old. There are about 15 hundred ambassadors. We don't currently have an ambassador in, in Rapid City, but I'm working on becoming one. And they uh, promote the game and, and teach. We do teach uh, on Monday nights. We just came from a teaching session here before this uh, session here. And we do, we do have over 100 people playing pickleball in Rapid City right now. Benefits of pickleball, hey, just like any other sport, being active helps you. Uh, it's a lot of fun, but it's also a real social game. People uh, come and, and while you're not playing, you're sitting around talking to your friends. I've been playing for five years. Of all the people that we have playing pickleball right now, I think there's only one that I knew before uh, I started playing pickleball. So I've made some great friends. We had a pretty wonderful Christmas party out of my house here just a couple nights ago and, and uh, had 30 people show up. And, and so it's not just the physical part, but it is a social also. And it amazes me when I watch uh, some of the uh, people play. We, we've got obviously an older, pe older set of people playing, how some of them come in and, and don't move very well, they don't get around very well, you know, and you watch them play pickleball for a year and it's all of a sudden it's like, wow, look at her go, or look at that guy, he's, he, he's moving out where he couldn't do it before. It's played both competitively and recreationally and there are quite a few tournaments being held more all the time. There's a pick pickleball uh, set up right there. That's one of the larger ones. I think that's St. George, Utah, I'm not sure. This came right out of the USAPA uh, website. Those, that's some of the places that they play pickleball. Obviously, they don't have all of them. If you zoom in on this uh, page, they actually show our site. People can go to this web page. I travel quite a bit. Most people of my age group travel around. Hey, you can go any place you want to in the United States and find a pickleball game. Here's some of the different courts and some of our players um, playing in different tournaments. The one in the lower right there is a court that they have over in uh, Sheridan, Wyoming, where we went and played a tournament. They took two ten tennis courts. They use it dual purpose, pickleball tennis, and they uh, actually covered an outdoor tennis court. And so now they can play pretty much year-round in that tournament or in that venue. Some of the recent tournaments, uh, some of us went to Watertown uh, this past month, and they had over 40 entries in there. They've just got a new indoor pickleball facility that, that they play in. Uh, players from our tournament, or from our, our uh, club went over there and, and brought home uh, five of the first six place trophies. And uh, the sixth one went to a gal who was partnered with one of our players. Casper, Wyoming had a state event. They had over 60. 60 uh, entries in their tournament. The USAPA National Tournament had over 1,600 entries. Registration was filled in 30 minutes. Two of our players went down there and finished fifth in the tournament. 
they, they grade them by uh, age group and uh, also ability. So you can be pretty much any age, any ability. The oldest player that was there, I think, was 91 years old playing pickleball. And some of them were pretty new to the game, hadn't been playing a long time. You grade them one through five, uh, and uh, they had 3.0 3 and 3.5 players playing there. So you can play, you know, to your ability, which is really nice. We are talking about building an outdoor pickleball court, or six of them actually, at Canyon Lake Senior Center. This is the layout and what it's going to look like. You can see there, we're going to be right up next to the uh, National Guard camp out there. This is a little closer view. We're hoping to have it lighted, have fences around each individual court, and uh, we're going to re relocate a picnic shelter, but we're going to have a little picnic shelter there and a place for everybody to play in the summertime. We had a meeting today, and we are actually talking about maybe enclosing this and, and making it inside a building. If we could do that, we could probably double the amount of time that we could play. We could have played outside today uh, if it was covered, covered court. This is kind of similar to what our new courts will look like. And this is the proposal that we're, we're working off of right now. It's going to take a fair amount of money. We've started raising money already. We've got uh, Jim Skull working with us. Uh, he's going to do some of the groundwork and also the uh, sound work for us. So we're hoping to have this completed. Our completion date is we're looking at is June 1st. Some of the benefits to Rapid City in the surrounding area. We are listed in the USAPA. I get phone calls on my name, my phone numbers, and I get phone calls on a pretty regular basis. People traveling to Rapid City in the Black Hills area wondering where they can play pickleball. I also got a word today that uh, the YMCA gets a lot of calls, and they didn't know where to direct them. So now we're going to talk to the YMCA and tell them, hey, we're playing down at the center. Send people down there if they want to play. Right now, we've got uh, three indoor courts that we play on. It's a pretty nice place to play, but we could do a lot better. The completion of the six outdoor lighted courts allow us to have uh, more people stopping in and playing and also to have tournaments here in Rapid City that will bring people in to the town. And you're obviously that brings uh, economic money for the city with, uh, you know, people staying here in hotels and eating and shopping, of course. Here's our projected costs. $157,000 is what our projection is right now. We're receiving donations. I stopped down to one of the local businesses today that uh, gave us $250. So uh, we're going out and talking to banks and some of the larger businesses in town trying to, to uh, raise money for the project. We would uh, welcome any recommendations that you might have for us. We do need help from the community. We can't do this by ourselves. We do have a pretty large group and it's growing, but there are only 100 of us. And we'd like you to consider helping the, the uh, funding of the project. And we think this is a worthwhile project. We'd also like to take a few minutes to uh, thank you guys for your time here today and extend a uh, challenge, I guess it would be, to uh, the members of the council and the mayor to come out and play pickleball and maybe have a little tournament with us. We think we're pretty good and we think we might be able to beat you. Bring it on, yeah, all righty. At this time, I guess my, I would ask for if you have any questions, uh, we would we would uh, be able to answer any questions you have or, or do our best to answer them. We don't have any questions at this time. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you all for showing up tonight. Uh, yeah, I'll take you up on that. All right, come on up. I'm going to play against the best in South Dakota, though. I've I get to play against them every day. It's not all that much fun. <laughs> But, Thank uh, you. We do have uh, beginner's night at uh, 5 o'clock on Monday nights. Come on out and we'll uh, teach you how to play pickleball. And I, I'll warn you right now, it's pretty addicting. You, you won't be able to stay away. Can I bring my children? You bet. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up on the, general is general public, on the agenda is general public comment. This is a time for members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the council on any issue not on the agenda. Action will not be taken at the meeting on any issue not on the agenda, except by placement on the agenda by the unanimous vote of the council members present. And I do have two speaker request forms under general public comment. The first one we have Julian Navarro. Julian, do you want to approach the podium, uh, the podium please?
I'll just wait for them to... Good evening, my name is Julian Navarro. Um, what I, I always say without the vision, people perish. And um, I'm just gonna speak from my heart today. There's a couple of things that uh, I, I, I would like to see in this community somehow, some way. Um, one of my hardest um, struggles was getting my ID. Uh, I would like to see a program that would help uh, more people get their ID, um, even getting tribal IDs. Um, I would also like to see more, more help for the disabled. Um, I, I see a lot of people struggle because I'm in a different area of town. I know that um, there's going to be this program coming out this year, hope, this coming year, hopefully. Um, I think that um, some things that, that would be like really, really good to help would be GED classes. Um, maybe some tutors or volunteer tutors to help people get their GEDs. Um, if it was easier for people to get their ID that are struggling on the, on the streets, I think that they would have more of an incentive to, to seek uh, um, employment. Um, another thing that, that I would kind of like to see is uh, sweat lodges for natives. I, I've been to one and uh, it, it really helped me. You know, it, it, I don't know how. It, it just did its thing, and um, I respected that. Um, I spent a little bit of time on the reservation. Um, another thing that I've been seeing lately is that there are single fathers out there, and I, I don't see a whole lot of assistance with them, um, but it would be nice to, to probably have uh, some type of program for single fathers. And I think that men get domestically abused as well, you know, so maybe some type of, um, Council, I mean, some type of meeting counselors or mentors or something like that, because I think that the, the domestic violence goes both ways. Um, and I would also um, bring uh, about maybe like some type of campground, like for people that are on the streets. Um, in Denver, on uh, Colfax, they have a little park. And the people that stay at that park, they govern themselves somehow. And the cops are real cool with it because, like, they don't be disturbed by anybody. And they, it, it's hard being out there, you know. Like, I know that the weather's here, and, you know, I still hear about how people are struggling. And, like I said, without any type of vision, people will perish. But it's not so much, um, it's, it's mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And um, I, I, I wouldn't want anybody to be hindered, like, if, there was something that that would give them hope, you know. Then I, I think that some of these programs could help them out. I think that it would help to decrease the crime rate, given uh, the fact that they have to be goal oriented. And if we make the goals smaller or shorter or easier, I think that people would be able to achieve a, a higher level of learning and a, and a higher level of, of care for employment. So thank y'all for y'all's time, and y'all have a good evening. Thank you, Julia. Next up, we have Ginny Robertson. And Ginny, as a reminder, three minutes. Okay. Yeah, not your first time, I know. Yo, yeah, not my first rodeo. Hey. Yeah. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Um, it's good to see you all again. I want to thank you, Jason, for coming that night with us. The last time I was here, we didn't get to say thank you, and we really appreciate it as a community. Um, once again, I'm here to talk about the Haynes Avenue Safe to Cross. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I did present you um, with a printout uh, that I pulled down from the internet, and, and it's easily it's easy to see that the the, the graphs and the diagrams and what it, and what it's saying. But I just want to read it really fast, and um, uh, it's physics really. I didn't write this. This was what was um, written by um, Alyssa Walker, well, based on a study done in 2011. Um, uh, four years of uh, U.S. car versus pedestrian uh, crash data. So um, it's simple physics, really. The faster cars going when it hits you, 
the more likely you'll be killed, but there's a correlation between the speed of the car and the likelihood you'll be killed, especially when you take age into consideration. Just uh, five miles per hour can make a uh, dramatic difference in whether you live or die. An interactive chart made by the ProPublica used data from a famous 2011 study that collected four years of US uh, car versus pedestrian crash data. Keep in mind, folks, this is a 2000 car plus a day problem on Haynes Avenue, not a pedestrian. Keep in mind, this is a very large residential area with a frontage being commercial now that has gone up there. With our city growing at 8.2% in 10 years, it is gonna continue to grow, it is not going to stop. Therefore, we are gonna get more cars. I lived on that road when it was a two, two lane road. Uh, as a child sledding down that road and then you were cool enough, you crossed that road on that sled into the field in front of my house. Um, now it's a four lane road, lots of cars coming through. We're coming in with 22 signatures, um, Ms. Gala and I and my husband, um, 14 of which are coming from the complete con concrete construction company that did work on the, and are still working on the Mount Rushmore Road today. Now, um, with that, um, if the cars are traveling at 45 miles an hour, which is a pretty standard speed for any cars to be traveling on major streets in the US, any person being hit is some like, is more likely to be killed than to survive. But if the speed is reduced by at least 10 miles per hour, our city is small enough that it's not gonna be a, a, that big of an impact if a person has to drive 10 miles per hour slower to get across town. We have a fairly small town with a very large car population traveling through Haynes Avenue, um, which I would argue would be a nearly now, could you, remember I, have not, I did not write this. Um, nearly uh, imperceptible speed uh, reduction from the driver's perspective. The chances of being killed plummet now about half of the elder pedestrians would survive. And it talks about even the age, and I would like for you guys to really study that. It's pretty basic. I mean, it's really common knowledge, and it's a great, it's a great um, um, study that they did. Patient advocates say that 20 is plenty. I wanted to get that out. The yellow light is blinking. I see that amber light on to illustrate that busy urban areas should never have speed limits um, over 20, especially in our area where we have two schools, lots of children cross, and lots of families. Thank you very much, folks. We'll be back. Thank you very much. That concludes our general public comment. <clears throat> we'll now go to non-public hearing items 4 through 48 and open public comment for items 4 through 41. And I do have a, uh, one speaker request form in this item for item number 20. William Clayton. Mr. Clayton. Good evening. And thank you, Council, for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'd like to speak on item 20, which is the Deer Management Program. It's on the consent calendar, calendar and I'm hoping that someone will pull it. Um, I'll be here for further questions and, uh, and more discussion on this. It's hard to tell where to start. I, I could go much longer than three minutes, and I, I won't. Hopefully, that'll happen in a question and answer session. What I'd like to address, however, first is there was a front page article in the Rapid City Journal. Um, that, that made some serious mistakes in, in my estimation. Uh, one, it talked about shooting bucks. That's never been part of this program. Uh, it has happened in the past and, and not always accidentally. Uh, we've got some shooters who I, I think are, have gone rogue uh, working in the cover of darkness, um, and I can speak more about that later. Um, also, that article went on to say that the highest cost in the program was the cost of processing the deer. Not at all true. It is, has been, and will remain that the highest cost is what we pay the sharpshooters to take care of these deer. Um, the, the way the program was written, there was a bounty of $65 per head on each deer, but the way the city chooses to pay these people is uh, as if it's part of payroll. So the city uh, has uh, an encumberment of taxation and instead of $65 a year, at least by the last figures I had, it was $77 and some change. So there's $12 and change that's wasted because it's borne by the city instead of by these people who should be paid as contractors and a bounty rather than being paid as payroll. Um, and I'll just end there and uh, as I said, hopefully somebody will pull this for consent and we can talk about it more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clayton. Uh, that will end the public comment for items 4 through 41.
We'll now go to consent items uh, 4 through 41. Would council wish to remove any items from the, from the consent count? All right. <laughs> Darla Drew. Item 25, please. 25, you said? Becky Jury. 22, please. 22. Okay. Steve Laurenti. Uh, chair, item 20, please. Any other items? I'll entertain a motion to approve items 4 through 41 with the exception of 20, 22, and 25. Second. We have a motion by Laurenti and a second by Drew. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Go to item number 20. Approve, authori approve and authorize Parks and Recreation Department to harvest 150 deer for the 2017-2018 season. I forgot who, who pulled that. Was it true? Was it? All right. Alderman Lorenzi, you got the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair. And if I may, I'd like to ask. Uh, I'd like to. Did you want to speak first, oh, Mr. No. Beagler? I'm just. I just wanted to ask. I wanted to have uh, Mr. Clayton, if he would, please, if he would approach the podium. We can share. Go oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Mr. Clayton, how are you? I'm good. So I remember uh, we were both on the council together during this particular uh, item, which I know you tackled uh, head on. And uh, it was my last understanding after we voted uh, as a council to adopt the program or if it was just uh, Parks and Recreation adopting the program. I don't know if there was a vote involved. I can't remember that far. But my question to you is, from what you see on the agenda, what has changed since that was apparently adopted by Parks and Rec. If you can just speak, I want him to speak liberally about that because he was very involved with it. Well, I, I'm, I'm known for being a liberal speaker and I'll, I'll try to be nice. Um, let me say this, this is a very meaningful and necessary program. I, I am not demeaning the program in, in the very least. Um, it, it was well conceived. Uh, and there's a lot of pieces that go into it that, that some people might not be aware of, where Game Fish and Parks actually does go out into various areas of the city. They do a census, uh, and, and they look at the population of the deer. They look at the number of problems, uh, uh, deer vehicle collisions and, and complaints. Uh, that we, we did institute a, a, a very um, intense. Mr. Clayton, I'm going to... Just, I, I just I want to apologize, but I want to interject as you're speaking because I have questions about things as you're speaking. So sure. while your mind is trained on those, I want to interject there. So I hope you're okay with that. That's fine. But to that, do you believe that's what's reflected in the program now as far as the census? I remember that part of it. There was an evaluation of where uh, the most problems were, complaints were, deer being hit by vehicles, that type of thing. Does the program in your mind still reflect that? That might be a question I can yes. answer Beagler as well. But Yes, yes and no. And, and in fairness, I, you know, I think Jeff's going to have some things to say as, as well, and I appreciate that uh, because he has been a part and parcel of that, you know, since his coming to Rapid City. Right. Um, the, there was a complaint system where, where complaints were then uh, tallied in order to identify problem areas. Um, but I had seen problems early on, and I had gone to the mayor, Mayor Sam Quaker at the time, voiced those concerns. He thanked me very much, and he was instrumental in getting me a seat on the Urban, Urban Wildlife Committee even before I took a seat as the council liaison. So I, I served in that capacity for about two and a half years and uh, really looked at it hard, took the program apart, and did identify numerous and sundry problems with it that I identified and took all the way to Jeff Vonk as the Secretary of Game, Fish, and Parks. Um, and there were changes made based on, on my input. Um, it has been my position, however, that when you give two grown men permission to break the law, um, hunt over bait, hunt at night, hunt with 22 uh, rifles, hunt out of a vehicle, uh, and on and on, that after years, and it's been almost 20 years, they begin to lose sight 
of reality and the responsibilities. So over the course of years, we have seen such things as hunting on private property without permission. We've seen bucks taken illegally, uh, carcasses turned in with the antlers missing, um, proper care not given to the carcasses so that the meat was, was wasted. Uh, I already addressed the, the, the part where I think we're paying too much. Um, so th there are problems that have not been addressed. Um, and, and let me apologize right here, you know, in that I have not been a part of this for a couple of years now. There may, in fact, be some changes that were made that I'm not aware of. And uh, if, if I'm barking up the wrong tree, I'll apologize um, right now and, and, and take it on the chin for anything I say that's wrong. So, Bill, let me interject again there, because the, on the bounty and the, the having them being paid as contractors, I think that's important. Was that an understanding when that was handed off, when you were part of that um, committee that put that new, some of the new changes to this program, was it your understanding that they were going to be paid, or that that was the, under, that was the agreement they were going to be just this straight bounty and they would be paid as a contractor, which would save the city money. Was that the understanding then? Do you remember? Let me say this way, <clears throat> excuse me, from the inception of the program, there was a dollar price placed, you know, the, based on the, the, the service of the people, the fact that they were working at night after hours, uh, in, in addition to their daily job, because they, they were both city employees. Um, you know, so there was an understanding that it, it, it wasn't fun, it wasn't recreation, that it was a job and they needed to be rewarded. Um, and it was always worded and uh, remains so to the best of my knowledge that there was a price per deer. But having worked as a contractor, you know, it, it's always been that if you're paid by the piece, then that's what you get paid, no more, no less. And you report that as income at the end of the year, and then you bear the responsibility for the taxes that you pay on that as income. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Slate, I'm sorry. I'm, this is the chair. We're, we, we're past our time on Alder Miller Ante's time, but we have another Alder woman who would like to ask a question, so maybe she'll let you finish that, that okay. comment. Alder woman jury, or excuse me, Armstrong. <laughs> do you want to finish, Mr. Clayton? I do have some questions for Mr. Beegler. I'll let it go with that. I, I, I think that's un understandable. It's just that uh, the, the city should not be bearing the brunt of those taxes. It ought to be borne by the people who are enjoying the reward of the bounty for the deer that they kill. Okay. Thank you for your time. Mr. Beegler, may I, or Chair, may I speak with Mr. Beegler? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I just have a few questions. Can you please um, verify how long this program has been in existence in Rapid City? Yes, this uh, program was approved uh, by the voters in Rapid City in uh, 1995, so it's been in existence since then. And uh, with the exception of two years, I think it was 2002 and 2003, uh, where there were no uh, deer taken, there have been deer taken every year. Right. And it's varied from uh, 100 to 300, I believe, okay. for those years where there has been a... a How do we determine who is who the sharpshooters are? Like, what are, I, I don't need names, yeah. but what their qualifications are? They are, they are um, uh, individuals that, that are... Uh, Rapid City uh, uh, employees, and uh, they do go through a proficiency uh, 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 training with the uh, police department to ensure that they uh, should be out there with, with guns, and they are people who are trained and, and have uh, uh, very common knowledge of, of, of the use of, of uh, firearms. And then how do you determine where exactly the harvesting takes place? Every uh, October, there are three dates in which uh, we send out staff, and uh, this last two years, it's been uh, mostly uh, Parks and Rec staff with the uh, assistance of Game, Fish, and Parks personnel. Uh, there are routes in uh, four different areas, different parts of town. There's a, a northern route, a, a western, a, a southern route, uh, which is kind of southeast, uh, and then a central route, which kind of uh, encircles the uh, 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 Skyline Drive area. So those are the four areas that uh, these uh, these uh, 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 scouting expeditions, if you will, uh, they go out and they, they survey the numbers that uh, that they see in those areas. And I will tell you that uh, this year the, that was conducted uh, in October, I think, 23rd, 4th, and 5th. 
Uh, they go out two evenings and once early in the morning. And those are the three times that they go and, and do this survey. Uh, the numbers that they identified this year in the survey were up about 38% from those numbers that they observed last year. And so based on those numbers, Game Fish and Parks uh, makes a recommendation as to the number of deer that they would like to harvest. And so last year, the last two years, we've uh, harvested 100 deer in each of those years. This year we are uh, going for 150. And then when do you determine when the harvesting, like, what is the timeline of the harvesting? They, they harvest after the first of the year, probably the first uh, two or three weeks of, of, uh, of January. Is it a short period of time? It's a short period over? of time, and it, and it depends on uh, the, the weather, it depends on the numbers of, of deer that are out there as to the duration of, of, uh, of the, uh, the actual harvest. I think last year it only took about a week or so. This year probably would take at least a couple of weeks with an increased number. Uh, but it, it varies every year. But Does this occur in any, re I'm sorry to cut you no, off, you're short, fine. Kind of, it's it's running fine. out. Does this occur at all in residential areas? I'm just thinking of liability to the city. All of the locations are chosen uh, with the criteria that's in the, the deer management program in which uh, uh, there has to be a, a safe backdrop for, for shooting against. Uh, they don't shoot in uh, populated neighborhoods, but they do uh, uh, pick uh, areas that uh, are perhaps either city property, parks department property, school property, or private property uh, where they've received uh, the permission from the landowner. There are some landowners that have larger parcels uh, in some of those areas, and, and those are the areas that are targeted. And one more question. They're taken humanely? Well, yes, they are. <laughs> you know, as humanely as possible. <laughs> Like they know these are, I'm sure, I just want to make sure that it's yes. painless. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Jeff, got three questions for you. Uh, I'm hearing some. Uh, uh, violations of their contract, and but I don't have a good idea of what the contracts contain. Uh, the accusations that are coming forward tonight. Can you clarify the uh, the issue of the antlers and some other things that uh, the uh, sharpshooters are going rogue on that? Well, have you got any information about that? Uh, some of those reports, I think, predate me uh, from when I started. Um, there are, on a rare occasion, uh, when a buck will be taken. The, the, the operation takes place you know, when it's dark and at uh, distance, and, and there are instances where perhaps a, a male deer with a short uh, prongs or is, you just can't see them all. The intent is to take antlerless deer. And uh, occasionally there have been in the past a, a buck or two here or there that has been taken, but not as uh, on purpose. Should Thank say. you. And then in a situation such as that, uh, I do want to get to the cost question as well. Um, but in a case of that situation, are the uh, sharpshooters compensated when they when there's a uh, miscalculation? By the shepherd. They are, and those uh, those antlers are uh, taken to the Game Fish and Parks Department, so they are uh, made aware of it. All of the deer that are taken are also logged as to where they're taken, what type of deer they're taken, and the conditions in which they're they're taken. And briefly on the the cost per sharpshooter, um, what I was hearing that they, that's a major portion of the cost of the uh, program. Um, can you briefly describe my understanding of what those sharpshooters are and I want to make sure I'm on the same page with you as understanding how and what those sharpshooters are, are uh, responsible for and how uh, to get that salary that they're getting or contract wage sure. that what they're getting. Right. They, they are compensated at uh, $65 per deer uh, if there are two two shooters out there, they do split that cost. So that is the cost that they get. Um, they are also, uh, the, the, the our uh, city uh, operating budget for this line item does also provide uh, for the ammunition and for the, the bait for the, the deer as well. 
So uh, basically the sharpshooters are responsible for, if I remember correctly, and I don't know if we're still doing it, but they, they set up a, a, a site, bait it, and then they're responsible for taking the animal as well to uh, processing. So all of that $65 is, is going towards a to Z on handling that, that uh, deer? Well, they do, uh, they are responsible for the baiting, so they do go out uh, every afternoon and, and freshen up the bait sites. Uh, they do uh, harvest the deer, they do dress the, field dress the deer, they deliver them to the parks and recreation uh, maintenance yard and hang the deer, uh, and then in the morning, parks and rec staff transports the deer to the processor because I've uh, run across some situations out there in the public that, that the uh, public understands that all their sharpshooters do is pull the trigger, yeah. and that's the end of it, um, which is not true. No. And, and so I want to make sure that the public is well aware of right. what the responsibilities are, and, and, and would you reiterate if there is a contract violation, what happens in that process? Well, if the, uh, the deer management program does specify that if there is a flagrant violation of, of the, the policy, uh, those individuals would be removed from the, the operation. And so there's a lot of um, at stake, if you will, for those, those employees. Correct. And I think that's the reason it was set up to use uh, city employees as the sharpshooters. So there is uh, some extra. Uh, yes. Worker comp, exactly. uh, all liability, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Sure. Mr. Thank Wigler, you. thank you for your time. Thank you. Now go to uh, Alderman Roberts. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Oh, wait a minute. No. Don't start that now. <laughs> Mr. Beagler, uh, could you clarify a little bit exactly how they're paid? Are they paid as a 1099 or are they paid through park and rec? I mean, one of the things that uh, Mr. Clayton said was they're getting paid, but then the city is paying the taxes on top of what they're being paid, correct? Well, I'm not really sure. I, I couldn't quite follow that, so I'm not really sure how, how that uh, was being explained. But they, they do submit a... Uh, an invoice to us and they are paid for the number of deer that they take. I mean, they are also on, they are city employees, but they are uh, uh, being paid that $65 per deer. And then the city pays the taxes on top of that, or as a 1099 employee, they are responsible for paying no, their the own taxes the on city, it. The city would pay the taxes on that, correct. Okay. Yes, as an employee. Can I, thank you very much. Can I ask a question of Pauline Sumption? Absolutely. Thank you, Pauline. How, how difficult would it be to change this to make them 1099 employees so they are just getting paid and responsible to pay their own taxes on this? Well, be a contract employee, yes. Right now, payroll falls under the HR Community Resources Division, so I have nothing to do with that. However, um, I do there, think there are, are some restrictions in place if you're an employee and what you can and can't do if it's contract labor. Um, if they're a 1099, it would be strictly contracted, not a contract employee or, or employee. Cause if you tell them what time they have to show up and do the work, if you restrict their schedule, if I know I'm a 1099 employee, I know how then, that works. Then we can't put it on a 1099 because we, they are truly an employee if we are, um, telling them what, when, where, how kind of stuff. How difficult would it be to figure out exactly what the tax burden is and to work that into the $65 an hour? It, to back it out, it wouldn't be that hard. Um, we would only pay the city's portion. The employee would still have their portion withheld from their check. Well, I think that's something we should at least take a look at. So I, I appreciate Mr. Clayton bringing this forward. If you don't mind coming up here for a minute, Mr. Clayton, I have couple of questions for you. I, I remember when uh, you were first put on the council on this because thank God you took my spot on that uh, <laughs> board. And you uh, still owe me for that. And you were very, very passionate about it and you still are and I, I appreciate that. I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, tell me what you think we need to do because you know I know how many deer I have in my neighborhood. Okay. And mostly I have bucks. It seems like 
they come in because they know they can come in in Rapid City and mm. during uh, hunting season they don't get shot and have some absolute huge beautiful bucks. It's wonderful. But uh, what temptation if you're looking at them in a scope? Uh, the one that walked out of my yard in front of me this morning, 10 feet in front of me, and stopped and looked at me, yeah, it was a big temptation. Mm. But uh, what do you think? You know me, I, I don't think very often. I just speak. Um, it, it's hard really to put your finger on any one single thing. And let me, let me say this. One of the things that Jeff offered is these are city employees. One of the sharpshooters uh, since the inception has been Don Brumbaugh, and it's, uh, it's, it's my understanding he has since retired. That means he is no longer a city employee. So it just negates everything that he just offered in, in regards to that explanation. So, you know, it, 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 in terms of pay, the city needs to find a way to pay them as a contractor and pay them. And I've got the official uh, finance report, and it says here, on 12-22-2011, 100 deer, $7,639.06. On 1-18-2012, 100 deer, $7,804.12. Add the two together, do the division, it's $77.22 a deer, not $65. And so, as I said, the city is bearing the cost back then of $12 per deer. So 150 deer this year, it's $1,800, you know, that the city is spending needlessly. You know, our job when we sit up there is to protect the taxpayer's money. And in this case, it's being wasted. Absolutely. You know, one of the things, and I want to bring this up real quick because unfortunately I have two. Alderman long. Roberts, you got a time unless somebody wants to yield their time to Will you. Somebody just give me a couple of minutes. Thank you, Becky. I you got to take a take a vote on that. So I don't think you do if you actually look at the Roberts you, rules. When I gave when I when I gave you my time last time, we had to vote on it. But majority. if you actually look at the Roberts rules order and you look at the way that the council, uh, I don't think you do have to vote on it. Let's just take a vote. And I didn't. Okay. Yeah, might not be a, an issue. We'll talk about that more All right. in the so, future. Yeah. So, Auto Woman Drury's giving her time to Auto Woman Roberts. That's five minutes. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you very much. And this is go. only going to take a few seconds. But uh, one of the things that was talked about when you were on the council, and I, I like the idea because Sioux Falls does, and it looks like we're always looking at ways to be more like Sioux Falls. But one of the things that they do is they have archery season within the city limits. And that saves a lot of money. And it seems like it's working there. So if, could you? If I may. Yeah, absolutely. My, my proposal was rather than turn this, uh, rather than you know, enjoy this, if you will, as a, a deficit to the city, let's turn it into a money maker and, and investigate at any rate archery hunting within the city limits. So I started doing all the homework. I, I, I contacted cities that are basically the same size as Rapid City. Um, I, I gathered their plans, I looked them over, and I presented them to the Urban Wildlife Committee. Somehow it leaked to the paper, and the Rapid City Journal reported that Rapid City was considering archery hunting within the city. So a few concerned citizens, and I mean a few, contacted through the city, the Urban Wildlife Committee, and the Urban Wildlife Committee immediately acquiesced, and it, it just it died on the vine. And it's a shame, because uh, just as a for instance, there's a deer problem out there on Ellsworth Air Force Base. It uh, reached its most serious level, would be one on final, hit a deer with its nose gear. Thank God there was no damage to the airplane. It killed the deer. Nobody was hurt. Um, but it raised the flag that something needed to be done. So uh, in the first year where something was done, the base employed the Rapid City sharpshooters to go out there. When they saw what the price was, they said there's got to be a better way. Then when uh, Gentry Boswell, Colonel Gentry Boswell, became the wing commander, he's a hunter, and he instituted archery hunting on the base. And now the base takes care of their deer problem with archery hunting on the base. Thank you. I appreciate that. And one of the things that I did look at when you were on the council and we were talking about this, one of the things that we have in Rapid City is a huge park system. 
So, you know, when people start thinking about archery hunting in the city, it's not going to necessarily be in people's backyards. Because we have M Hill, we have Dinosaur Hill, we have all kinds of open spaces where this could be done, where we know a lot of these deer are quote unquote hanging out. So I think it's something we should look at and we should look at again because, you know, this is one of the costs. We're always looking at cutting costs somewhere because we don't have enough money. So anyway, thank you. Um, may I say one thing? Um, if you will watch this year, as Mr. Bigler pointed out, that the deer kill program happens very quickly. And it's been my position, and it remains so, that these gentlemen who go out to harvest these deer do it in the quickest way possible to collect the check. In, in their case, it's about money, not trying to be the, the best stewards of the resource to mitigate the problems in the city. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up, Alderman Lewis. I think make motion to approve and retain the floor, please. Second. Got a motion by Lewis and a second by Nordstrom. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Rear. Chairman. Sure. Uh, I do appreciate, obviously, Alderman Clayton, excuse me, former Alderman Clayton bringing this forward. I know he's very passionate about it. He brought it up before, and I do appreciate someone that actually pays attention to these kind of programs because most of us really don't and don't have the time or the, the, even the passion for it. So. I do think, however, we're too late in the, in the season to, uh, to make any changes or to you know, halt the program. Obviously, we have a really, really light winter going on at this point and a very large deer population, which is going to become even a bigger problem, I think, as the season goes on. So, and I will say, um, I do tend to agree with, uh, well, I actually tend to agree with, I respect the opinion of our finance officer as far as what contract labor can and cannot do. And I think there's pretty stringent rules about that and laws. So, I don't know there's any, our hands might be kind of tied and how we can pay them. I don't know that. I'm not an expert, but I'm going to respect the, defer to the opinions of the experts. I also say that Mr. Bigler and his department have always been very honorable and very professional in their dealings. Everybody, I don't think there's anything beyond, beyond what, uh, I mean, they're, they're definitely doing their best to, to, to uh, take care of the tasks they've been handed. So I don't think there's any underhanded thing going on. And, you know, when you do the math, it's $9,700 basically and some change. It's not a lot of money to take care of an issue that's obviously can be a big issue when you, especially when your car runs into one of them or however it works. A lot of people, that happens all the time around here. It's part of living in the city, but I, you know, once again, I think it's too late to do anything about this year. I do think Mr. Clayton, if you would like to get back on that committee, maybe put some input into it again. I mean, you're, obviously your opinion is valued and very useful. And obviously I have more knowledge about this than most of us do, so I would appreciate that. But at this point, I think we need to move forward and uh, go forward with what we have before us. Thank you. Okay, Alderman Lorenzo, you're out of time. Sorry. The motion's made. So we got a motion to approve by Lewis, second by Nordstrom. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next up, we'll go to item number 22. Approve the appeal of denied exception request from Spurlick Consulting on behalf of Freeland Meadows, LLC, to not construct county road with a minimum 36-foot wide paved surface curb, gutter, streetlight conduit, sewer, sidewalk at intersection, degrading for sidewalk along development of parcels. And we'll go to Lisa Modric. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the appeal of denial exception um, as um, recommended by committee. And if I can retain the floor, thank you. There was a terrific dialogue at our public works meeting uh, regarding this particular exception and the varied reasons why this exception is of its time. And that's why I would hope that we could get support on council for this um, extended expense for the development of workforce housing that we have such a great need for. Uh, with, with this exception, this allows the prices of those homes and the lots of, the, of those homes to go in now, which is we, we needed them yesterday. So it allows us to uh, proceed forward with getting the homes built. That entire country road is still a country road. It's still maintained as a country road. The development is uh, coming, however, up to this development. There is not um, infrastructure uh, built to these particular specs. So it's really doing a enhanced project 
in the middle of nowhere at this point. The time may come, but the time is not today. So I'd like to see us support the developer and the costs and the risks that go with that in order to get these homes built and um, get this workforce housing going where it's affordable. If that's our work uh, at hand. That's what the city's uh, vision and direction is going towards, and this is going to help that project. So I hope we can get support on this uh, motion and uh, allow this exception to go through. Thank you. Thank you. Now go to Alderwoman Drury. Thank you, Chair. May I ask Dell Tech, I think would be the appropriate person, even though Ken Young signed one of the papers. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Tech, I know that this came from Public Works as a rejection, and I drove out there today just to make sure I knew what I was talking about. And I guess I typically vote against exceptions because I think if we have an ex if we always have an exception, there's something wrong. The rules should be changed. So could you tell us why this was rejected at Public Works? Certainly. Um, staff is being consistent in looking at our criteria, which is very specific about what the requirements are. Our um, subdivision improvement ordinance, which is Title 16, indicates that all right-of-ways adjacent to development must be um, constructed to the current standard. There have been a number of exceptions before you recently. For instance, Creek Drive uh, exception, same type of request to not make any improvements, as well as Dias Avenue, I believe, north of Seeger Drive. So staff is trying to be consistent with what the rules are and bring those recommendations to the City Council. And then if if we allow this and it's not paid for, will it have to be paid for at a later date? Are we just kicking the can down the road and then we have these, quote, affordable homes out there, but then they're not affordable when we have to pay for them later? I mean, who's going to pay for these development costs later? Right. That's, that was part of the recommendation on our summary that was attached to the agenda that in the future it will be the responsibility more than likely of the, the taxpayers of the city to fund the reconstruction of Country Road. Okay. And so really then the, these costs will come back to the, the citizens will have to pick them up. The rest of the citizens of Rapid City will have to pick up these costs at a future date. At some point in time, yes. I yield. Thank you. Now go to Alderman Drew. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a couple questions for um, Mr. McNamara, if I could please. <coughs> yes, uh, Kale McNamara, Sperlick Consulting. I represent the petitioner. Um, yeah. Um, Hi again. And um, so last time we spoke about this, I was asking if you had any way to make this a benefit to the city and, you know, the ecological benefits of not putting in per curb and gutter. Did you look into that at all? Yeah, really the benefit to development of this property, um, and I, I, I hope you'll indulge me a little bit. I tried to go into this at uh, Public Works, is, and maybe I didn't do it very well. Um, we, have, we do have a regional detention cell that's going to occur on this parcel. And when the city does a drainage study, they set up um, basically a drainage master plan where they establish where the city would like to have their drainage infrastructure occur at. In this case, we have a, a low-lying area that traverses the property. It's going to dead end on um, La Crosse Street, future La Crosse Street, which is our eastern property line. Um, development of this parcel is going to create that regional detention cell. Um, I've also gone through it as a part of this and laid out an alignment from the cross street all the way to the south for another mile until it hooks into that uh, the existing terminus okay and um then when we were talking about this at public works um you were you were saying how much money that you would save on this project and you said it's roughly a million dollars would be saved by not doing these projects yeah yes um so I, I do a lot of subdivisions in Rapid City, and I, I evaluate um, per lineal foot of street what a street costs, and I keep a running average to all subdivisions. And uh, roads in Rapid City run 675 bucks a foot on the average. 
Um, if you think about this 1,400 lineal foot of frontage at 675 bucks a foot, that's $945,000. Um, it's an arterial street which would require a traffic study, um, basically signalization at the future lacrosse country road intersection. Uh, when you start factoring that in, you're probably talking on the order of 1.2 million would be my guess to build that 1,400 feet of country road. So um, in essence, if we say yes to this, um, the city will be gifting you a million dollars. You know, you'll save it. And this is kind of from the city to you to build these homes. It, we're going to give you a million dollars to build these affordable homes. Is that really true? Is that what I'm getting? Really what we're looking for is to try to keep this workforce housing affordable. Mm -hmm. um, so when you take you know, $1.2 million and spread it over the 105 residential lots that we're talking about, that works out to additional ten to $12,000 per lot if you spread it over all 105 of those lots. Um, a typical lot with 75 foot of frontage is going to cost you $25,000 to build that road. So you, do, you put another ten to twelve grand on top of that, it makes each one of those lot costs not $25,000, makes it $35,000. That's just to build roads, it's to build the road right in front of you and then to build country road. So, um, what do you think the cost will be of the homes that you're talking about? You know, if we do say, you know, fine, you know, you're going to do natural drainage and all those things, we're going to put off putting a road in there. What is going to be your affordable housing cost or workforce housing cost? Yeah, the workforce housing cost that we're looking for in this subdivision is that 180000 to $225,000 range. That's workforce housing. I really like that. I, I think that's affordable. Um, you know, I'm still thinking about this and I'm going to listen to my colleagues. Uh, one thing in the future I just would like to say, you know, as we have a, an aging senior population of which I am part of, um, I'd like to see some, some uh, one-story homes go into some of those places as well. So just, just think about your, your future demographics if you would. So um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to Alderman Roberts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I find this conversation really interesting because we're talking about incentivizing a subdivision, which I think we need to do. Um, but about a year ago, we incentivized a fiveplex, not more than a few blocks from here, at over $20,000 per unit. And that went through this council almost unanimously, other than me, that voted against it, I think. I, I don't think there was anybody else that voted against it. I think that we do need to help incentivize people to get them to build in Rapid City. Those rooftops are what pay the taxes. Those people coming in pay sales tax. They pay property tax. If we have to give something back, you know, because Mr. Tech said this council did not vote for Creek Drive. They didn't. I did. And guess what? It didn't get built. And guess what? It's probably not going to get built because they needed that money to be able to make the project work. Just like they need the money to make this project work at $34,000 a lot. Now if we want to have $44,000, $45,000 lots, we can do that through this council. But they can go to Box Elder and buy lots for $35,000 a lot. So if you want to put rooftops in Rapid City, we as a council have to find ways to help the developers, help the builders to build in Rapid City. That's what we need to do, and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that we have to do that, but with land prices as high as they are, with building materials as high as they are, with the cost of labor as high as it is, if we don't help incentivize, somebody else is. Whether it's Box Elder, whether it's Somerset, whether it's Sturgis, if we want to be competitive in Rapid City, we've got to help our builders, our contractors, and our developers. So, thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to Alderman Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just for the record, I voted for Creek Drive with you. Just. Um, and just one thing I want to clarify to those, to those of you out in media land and television land, we're not giving anybody a million dollars. If they, if, if they did have to build this, it's, it's a pass-through at best. It's going to be added to the cost of the lots. So they wouldn't be getting an extra million dollars in the pocket. They would charge an extra million dollars to the consumer, which would make a less affordable project, and it's not going to happen probably in that case anyway. But So 
Um, yeah, I can show you statistics from the National Home Builders. Every time you raise the house price $1,000, you kick 200,000 people out of the market. And that is a very real statistic. Um, you know, I say it's only $10,000 here, $10,000 there, but you're talking real money. And uh, we want to get these, it's, it's, it's impossible. If they can really hit these, market, these margins they're talking about, these prices, excuse me, great, because we need to do it, because it, there's, no, there's nothing in that price range right now, especially not new. And uh, to increase our tax base, and this is just all part of growing it, growing our community as anybody rooftops up, as my colleague said. So please do not say that we're giving away a million dollars, because we're not giving away a million dollars. That's not even close to the truth. So thank you. Thank you. Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to reiterate a few things that I said at the Public Works Committee meeting, plus I've learned something else new as well, is that um, it, 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 I have to agree with uh, Alderwoman Drury about who's going to pay the cost, um, because we know we're kicking, it, kicking this can down the road uh, as well. Um, by the way, do we have a motion yet? I'm not even sure what the motion is yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no motion. Motion. To. Motion to approve. Yeah. I'm going to go along with this motion, but I, I just, uh, as my con biggest, largest concern is, uh, as uh, Alderwoman Drury mentioned, is who's going to pay for it down the down the road. I, I think we have to think a little bit larger than just what today is. And um, if the mayor is actually going to put together a task force to review this, um, I'm hoping that we can do that so that we can uh, resolve future issues that are, that are like this, because we know we're going to get some more um, very comparable issues on this. So I, I'm encouraging this council to think larger than this, um, because there's, there's uh, some ideas out there. State legislature is working on something. Um, we're trying to come up with something, and um, there's some other people that are just basically kind of nibbling around the edges, but the bottom line is um, the, the cost for the future homeowner for that. Um, the, other, the other factor that is coming up for me is that we're starting to see a few more people requesting um, uh, dark skies. And without street lights going in, that's going to help us out with dark skies. Uh, unfortunately, uh, th that, that's an unfortunate situation um, because we're also going to give up uh, sewer, sidewalks, um, all, all of those things at this point. So when we start installing all of these things, um, it, it, for me, it still comes back. How can we incentivize the developers, the builders, and still not have a severe impact upon the homeowners because now the way the system is set up currently, even if we came back and did an assessment, we're going to be taxing those property owners. And, um, and I don't think that's a fair way to do it either. So we've got to come up with some different system than, than what we're doing it right now. And I, I'm just, but I, again, I'm going to be supporting this, but we've got to look larger than this. Thank you. I'll yield. Thank you. We now will go to Lisa Modric, who has one minute, 30 seconds. Oh, I got to talk fast. So one thing that we've got to remember is that this is still country road development, which is, uh, which is needed. It's necessary. We've got to do it. It's land that doesn't have any development on it at all. Therefore, it's not generating any kind of property tax. This is going to stimulate property tax. It's doing it down the street, which doesn't have this particular paved surface, curb gutter at the time, this shouldn't either at the time, the time will come. Across the street, there's no development yet. When that time comes, and it does on both sides, now we've got an arterial road that actually meets the needs to include a lacrosse intersection, but that's not today. Uh, it's not, we don't know if it's in 10 years, we don't know if it's in 20 years, but today, what we need is to contri con contribute to the development of these <coughs> Uh, this housing project and let's hope that it continues to infill the housing project and takes land that has nothing on it and create property taxes it's those property taxes we can't forget that those are also taxpayers so they're going to be building on their property taxes which will come back and feed that artillery road at some point so it's not uh, it's not like there isn't tax generated once the houses go up we now are going to start collecting property taxes right now 
we're not collecting anything on it. So we need that uh, property tax base. We need to do this. And once we call in, I mean, if we're going to do this, then we need to call in the whole road because we're building this infrastructure in, as an outside donut. It's not going to connect or touch anything, probably not for a long time. So this is the time to match what's already happening out there. Let's put some people in some homes. Time's up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Alderwoman Drury, you have two minutes, 15 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple more quick comments. If we put another high, 105 houses out there, that's another 200, probably 200 cars at least, and that is a country road. It's not safe. And I, I fully believe that if they build this development, the rest of the area is going to grow. So let's grow it the right way without all the exceptions. Let's grow it the way it's developed and the way our city planners have it all worked out and I'm going to say it again, if there's something wrong with the way our city public works has things planned out, let's change it there. Let's not come to council all the time and change it here. Let's not always come before us and make us do the exceptions. Let's change it at the city level, not here. The, we shouldn't be doing these ad hoc changes to benefit this developer or that developer. Let's do what's right for the entire city. I yield. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to Alderman Lewis, who has three minutes and 59 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Madam Chairman. Mr. Chairman, excuse me. That's <laughs> eh, a long night already. So, you know, it's, it's actually to um, Ms. Drury's point, I, part of the, the thing why it's coming here is because it has to. The staff's hands are kind of tied. Even if they did want to do this, sometimes they have to go by the design criteria. So that's why it has to come through this process to, to us first. We're the, only, we're the only ones that can make that exception, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. So they can't just make that exception willy-nilly. They have to actually get approval by us. So that's um, why it comes before us. But getting back to uh, the idea of, well, we should do this. Once again, it's not going to be affordable housing if they have to add this money. It's going to get passed on, and it's going to cost, as Alderman <coughs> Roberts pointed out very well, it's going to cost the price of the house. It's going to go way up. But besides that point, I'm, something in the future, not on this particular development. I'm not making the suggestion, so please don't add to this one. Perhaps what we can do from now on is we can start adding requirements to developments that, you know, will approve a, a development provided that a certain percentage of those houses fall into a certain workforce housing price point or something along those lines to, therefore, and, you know, yeah, I hate the word incentivize, but incentivize people to bring forth projects that are multi, you know, m mixed uh, use developments and, so, and price points and all that thing. So um, just, a, just an idea, something to think about, but I'm obviously in, in strong support of this motion. Thank you. Call the question. Thank you. Alderman Roberts, you have two minutes and 21 seconds, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Becky. Becky wants me to call the question, but I'm not going to. So, uh, you know, I, I think this has been a great conversation. I do want to say that I think that, uh, you know, Becky makes some good points, that we do need to make some changes here. You know, I think that um, Chad makes some good points, too. But, you know, one of the things, bringing these lots in at, at this price point is going to keep the price down. Nobody's going to buy a $34,000 lot or a $35,000 lot to build a half a million dollar house on. That's just not the way it works. I mean, people that are looking at buying or building a higher end house, they're going to buy a higher end lot. So this is, gonna, this is going to generically bring in the workforce housing. It's going to bring in the housing, you know, that we need $200,000 and less you know, hopefully, you know, 160, 165, whatever we need to do. Um, I think that we're moving in the right direction as far as some things that we, we're doing. I appreciate uh, our, our new community planning director. I think he's got a lot of vision and, you know, a lot of people have said a lot of good things about him so far. And I think that, I think going forward, I think this council is starting to finally have some vision, which makes me very happy. I like that. I think that uh, we can work with builders, developers, businesses to make Rapid City a little more palatable to work in. And I think a lot of us want to do that. We want to see Rapid City grow, and we want to see it grow the right way. But, you know, just because 
we have neglected, and I'm going to say this again, I've said this a lot of times, just because we as a city have neglected our infrastructure for a long time doesn't mean that we have to force the developers coming in to take care of that infrastructure. So, you know, we need to find ways to take care of it, to take care of what we have, upgrade what we have, but one of the ways that we can do that is by growing the city, by growing our tax base, by growing the businesses that come in here, not by making it difficult for them. Anyway, I'm getting the thing. So I appreciate this conversation, and anyway, thank you. Thank you. Alderman, Alderwoman Drew, you have 49 seconds. Okay, I'll make this quick. Um, you know, there's a sustainability movement that's going towards, you know, natural drainage where you don't do the um, curb and gutter and those kinds of things where you let nature take its course to filter the water. I've given this um, point to many developers and, and I hope you get it, you know, because there are some benefits to not just paving. And um, I think that we can, always, we can always do cement, we can always pave, but you can't always go back to, uh, to natural grasses. So that's all I got to say about it. It's, I think there's some good points on leaving it the way it is. Just as a reminder, the, the motion on the floor is to approve the exceptions. Go to Alderman Lorenzi. Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to uh, chime in a little bit because I had a couple of other things that were brought up. But I think what Alderwoman Drury was specifically drilling in on was changing the design criteria itself. So the, the staff has the ability to say, uh, no, you don't have to do this. This is the new design criteria. However, what I do want to speak about is the cost. Because ultimately, somebody pays the price. It's, the question is, is, like I said, about the fees with the swim center. Somebody has to pay the cost, either the developer and these new people who are buying these houses or the new owners 10, 12 years from now when this is going to get ordered in. So it, this isn't, a, we aren't avoiding any costs. We aren't making it. What we're doing is making it very easy for our developer to make more profit. I have nothing against profit. There is no incentive that is needed for a developer in Rapid City to make money. Developers in Rapid City do quite well quite well, and we have no problem with uh, the amount of new development in Rapid City. We have new, new, new development going up everywhere in Rapid City. The question in this particular issue is what we have talked about many times. When we, when we sat or seated this new council, and the council just before this last election, we talked about how we weren't going to make the same mistakes that previous councils made by making all of these exceptions, and we were doing pretty well. But here we are again, because here's the problem. Elected officials want to be able to take credit for the growth now while they're in the seat, because they can come out and say, see what we did while I was on the council? That's the problem. That's part of the problem. We don't think about the long term, which is some of what was brought up tonight. Do, are we going to do this right, like Alderman Drury said? If we're going to grow it, let's grow it right. The fact that this may or may not go in if it gets approved or denied, just brings back a different de development for this particular, pr particular property that will be profitable. If indeed it isn't profitable, which I'm sure people would just be aghast if we, or myself, if I asked for the financials on this deal, a lot of people on this council would not be happy if I said, well, if we're going to give these, if we're going to change, we're going to give them an exception so that they're not having to put in this million dollars worth of infrastructure. I want to see their financials. If they're saying it's not, see, there we go. We got somebody ringing in already. If I said, I want to see those financials, I want you to prove to me because you're coming to us to ask for an exception. You're coming to government to ask for an exception that increases your profitability. And if it's not increasing your profitability, they should be more than willing to show us their financials. And they would tell all their friends, oh, uh, Alderman Laurent, he wants to see our financials now. Is that guy crazy? No, I'm not crazy. Not when you're coming to government to ask for a favor. And this is the problem. We're now back to making all of these exceptions, which we said we would not do, and we're going to pass the cost on. And it will be greater in the future because these infrastructure items, as we all know, don't go down. They go up in price. Concrete, pavement. So future owners will bear the brunt, future taxpayers. Let's do it right. Vote no. Send the right message. Let's make these people go back and 
if they don't do this development, somebody will. Somebody will look at this parcel of land and develop it differently so that it does generate the profit that they need. And I want them to make profit. But we shouldn't be making exceptions here. I yield. Okay. With that, the motion on the floor is to approve the appeal, the denied exception request. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. no. Passes with two no's from Lorenti and Drury. Okay. Good discussion, folks. Next up, we're going to item number 25. Authorized Mayor and Finance officer, officer to sign the Joint Powers Agreement between the South Dakota Department of the Military and the City of Rapid City for tree thinning on property adjacent to West Rapid, West Camp Rapid. And I believe this was Alderwoman Drury, is that correct? Uh, or, Drew, excuse me. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. <laughs> anyway, um, I have a few questions for Interim um, Fire Chief Seals, if I could, please. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so this is land adjacent to the guard land. Doesn't that make it our, our problem anyway? I mean, why do we need this joint re cooperative agreement? What's that about? This allows us access to West Camp Rapid to get to the land that we're actually thinning. Uh, okay, well that makes Access through the, the National Guard camp. Okay, and so this is actually city property that we're going to thin? No. no. Nope. Um, this is uh, United States government land in trust. It's a trust that the United States government holds for a... Um, American, Native American, and I, I can't remember the exact, I tried to look it up on Rapid Map and it cut it off short, so I know it's trust land that's operated by oh. the United States government. Okay, but we're responsible for thinning the trees on it. I mean, I'm all for it because, I mean, with the situations we've had, you know, with the recent Custer fire and things like this, I'm totally uh, in, in favor of this, but I just want to know whose responsibility is it and, and why is it ours. So it's not necessarily our responsibility to thin it. What we do is we look for partnerships, um, specifically on government lands, these type of lands. Uh, we have a very successful uh, Bureau of Land Management veteran crew um, that uh, we get a grant through BLM that we put veterans to work. We've been doing it for many years. And so a lot of the funding for uh, the actual thinning comes from uh, the Bureau of Land Management as well as some other grants and, and also some city money. Great. I, I'm glad that you answered that question. It really cleared it up for me. Thank you. Uh, I yield. Okay. Alderman Nordstrom, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. To uh, make a motion to uh, authorize the mayor to sign the joint power. Second. A motion by Nordstrom, second by Modric. Did you want to make retain the floor? Okay. Um, this is one of the things that I've been advocating for some time is uh, uh, private partnerships, and in this case, it's a P4. It's public, uh, it's public, private, private uh, partnership. And in fact, uh, there's another public involved in this. So I, I really appreciate the uh, um, the uh, creative thinking that the folks are doing now with, with uh, coming up with more joint power. So I really support the idea of doing more partnerships like this. And it, as uh, Chief Seal says that uh, um, developing more partnerships out there in the, in the world is, is a good thing. Thank you. Yield. Okay. Motion on the floor is to approve. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. That takes us to the end of consent items. We will now move on to non-consent items, items 42 through 48. We will open public comment on items 42 through 48. I do have some speaker request forms. We can either take them now or wait till the item comes at hand, I suppose. Take them Let's do it. All right. First up, we have uh, on item 45, Brent Borenson. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And just so you know, you have three minutes. Green, the yellow means you have 30 seconds, and the red means you're done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council. I'd like to ask Julie Orock to speak first, please. Julie Orock, you have okay. My name is Julia Rock. I'm the majority owner of the Black Hills Patrol. Um, we just have some process issues with this ordinance. Um, um, we do not see that um, any of the other licensed security companies were even notified about this. Um, it will um, impact us um, financially, so we kind of would have liked to have known a little bit about it. Um, we have always strived to make sure that we are in ordinance. We've always gotten approval. Um, our scheme has never changed since 2010. 
Um, and so um, that's kind of where we're at. We're kind of wondering why nobody was notified about this, too. And when we get to your item, we can certainly pose that question to the chief. Is that all your items, um, Sorek? And we'd like to have it removed from the consent calendar as well until these things are, are done. Okay. Um, we also have another speaker request form, unless... Yeah, I'm no Ken Rocco. I have one of the speaker request forms. I'm also one of the owners of Black Hills Patrol. And I'd just like to take a few minutes and discuss with the council sort of how the process works for the marking of security vehicles and a little bit of history towards how these ordinances have evolved. Uh, markings of any security vehicle in Rapid City along with uniforms, patches, badges, all those things have to be submitted to the police chief before approval before they're actually put into use. And that's exactly what we did in 2010 and then Chief Allender uh, approved all those items. The current vehicle marking scheme that's been in place for eight years now, the uniforms, et cetera. Uh, sometime later after that, I believe it was in 2011, uh, then Lieutenant uh, Jagris called me up and asked me about the markings of our vehicle, and uh, he wasn't aware they'd been approved, and once he was, uh, did a little research and found that, he came back and asked me if I'd be willing to make some changes uh, to the markings of our vehicles. And of course, we agreed to that, and we did make some changes, and we placed clearly markings on the front fenders on both sides of the vehicle that it was a private security or private patrol vehicle. And these aren't minuscule markings. A um, little bit disheartened that the police department felt the need to go out in the middle of the night and take pictures of our vehicles on private property. We certainly would have made them available to them or even brought them here for the city council if we'd been asked. But it clearly shows the markings that show that it's a private company are the same size as our phone number on the vehicle, same size as our website. These are not small markings, these are advertising, so we make sure they're visible to the public. Also in 2011, uh, because of some concerns with the ordinances, uh, Mayor Hanks put together an ad hoc committee to review the security ordinances in the city. And that ad hoc committee com consisted of members of the industry, all the major security contractors in Rapid City were represented. Uh, Chief Allender placed one of his lieutenants on that committee. Uh, the Sheriff's Department had one of its lieutenants on the committee. Then City Attorney Green sat as a member of that uh, and an advisor to that committee, and then several members of the public at large. And that committee, which I was on, spent six months reviewing all the ordinances, coming up with proposals for changes. And it included changes having to do with the markings of vehicles, with uniforms, with insurance requirements. Uh, the contractors would have to carry a certain insurance level within the city, the same as other contractors have to. And all of those proposals, after six months, went to the city council, and then Police Chief Allender shot them all down, every single one of them, which included something that would have addressed some of these issues here. Eventually, one of the items did get passed through council, and that was to change it from a one-year to a two-year licensing period, which has been a lot of relief for some of our employees. So a lot of these things need to be looked at again, and they should not occur in a piecemeal basis. In, the industry should be included. We should put together another committee and look at it. Instead of piecemealing this, which is going to lead to uh, nothing more, more problems, that we would suggest the mayor do a similar thing. And I also request this be removed from the consent calendar and put for further discussion. Okay. Mr. Morris, did you wish to use your time? Yes, now? sir. Please. Okay. Thank you. Um, council, thank you for having us be tonight. Uh, two points. I won't need three minutes, but two points that kind of bother me with this is not only the fact that pictures were taken of our vehicles to use as an example for this item. Um, I clearly would have had vehicles cleaned up. I don't want the general public to see dirty vehicles that we take a lot of pride in. And me running operations for the company, I hold that dearly. We are a small business. The expense for us to change the decals on those vehicles is an expense for us. That hurts. I hear the council talk about expenses to the public and small business owners out there. That hurts us to have that expense. We want to do these changes. We're not going to fight this. We'll, we'll change it if we need to. We're a part of that. We comply with that. But just know that it is an expense and it kind of hurts that these pictures were taken of our vehicles as a small business owner in this town. 
we would have loved to invite somebody to come down and take a look at our vehicles and discuss this. We certainly could have do, done that. Our door is always open. Thank you. Thank you. And just so you know, this is not on a consent calendar. It's on our non-consent, so it will be addressed. I agree. Thank you. Next up for item number 48, we have Tachi Weaver. Ms. Weaver. 48. Good evening, Council. Uh, I wrote a few remarks just so that I wouldn't waste too much of your time. Um, through the referendum process, the Rapid City taxpayers and voters have spoken loud and clear against Ordinance 6201 and the subsequent water rate increase. Through an all-volunteer effort, in three weeks, more than the required number of valid signatures of registered Rapid City voters were collected on petitions in order to refer that ordinance to a public vote. Our effort has now been certified to be valid by City of Rapid City personnel. Collecting such a large number of signatures in such a short time simply would not have been possible unless the vast majority of Rapid City taxpayers and voters were against the actions of the council. It's true that the voters usually make the correct decision when they have access to the facts. To that end, between now and the scheduled election, we will be posting directly on the website reformrapidcity.com as much factual information regarding Ordinance 6201 and the water rate increase as we have available. That website will be up and running very soon. Ultimately, we will respect the final decision of Rapid City voters, and we hope that you will do so as well. Um, I will say that it was an interesting experience uh, visiting with that many people. I myself visited with hundreds of people, and um, they came from all areas of the city. Every single one of your wards was well represented in the cross-section of people that signed our petitions. Um, they are actually the petitioners. We were just the circulators. They are the ones petitioning their government for redress. Um, they have a problem with moving to a resolution process as opposed to an ordinance process. No one says that it's illegal, but we don't think it's a very ethical way to operate. Um, we'll see what the voters say about that. It seems that people... Uh, you know, I struggle for proper adjectives to describe the attitude of the people. I would say probably the one that stands out the most is oppressed. They feel oppressed. They feel oppressed, betrayed. Um, they feel um, helpless to do anything about it. And they were eager to sign the petitions because at last it seemed there was something they could do about it. So thank you for um, your time and um, whatever day you choose, if it's the 20th of February, that's, that's fine. We have no objections to whatever day you would choose for an election. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now close the public comment on items 42 through 48. Now we're going to move to item number 42. First reading ordinance number 6214 an ordinance regarding supplemental appropriation for 2017, and the recommendation is to approve. A motion by Nordstrom and a second by Drew. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 43, first reading, ordinance number 6215, an ordinance regarding supplemental appropriation number six for 2017, and a recommendation to approve. So moved. We have a motion by Modric and a second by Nordstrom. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Item 44, first reading of ordinance number 6213, an ordinance amending chapter 5.36 of the Rapid City Municipal Code relating to pawnbrokers, secondhand dealers, and gems and precious metals dealers, and the recommendation is to approve. Come. Motion by Modric, a second by Drury. Does that work? Sure. All in favor? Aye. Oh, up. Sorry, Alderwoman Drew. Thank you. I'd like to um, address a couple questions to Chief Jaggers, if I could. 
Um, hello, Chief. And, um, you know, I know we've got, gone through this before with the, um, the uh, licensing of pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers. And, and so why do we need these changes at this time? Um, well, as you mentioned, when we went through them before, the council did put a sunset clause on, on it at that time. That sunset has passed, so the pawnbrokers are no longer required by ordinance to photograph jewelry that's received. Um, however, most or all of them still do, but they're not required to. Um, so we need to restore that so that um, they're required to do that. Additionally, there's just a couple of updates that provide um, the pawn brokers and the police department the ability to better prevent stolen property from being pawned, which is in the best interest of everybody, including um, requiring a declaration of ownership when somebody uh, provides an item to be pawned, the pawn shop is required to establish who the owner of that item is when they're receiving it um, verbally from the person that's pawning it. And then um, it also prevents felons who have committed a weapons offense, a crime of violence, or a drug offense within five years from, be from becoming owners of pawn shops. Okay. Um, uh, it, I've been contacted by a constituent on this particular thing, so um, when you talk about f photographing jewelry, okay, I get that, but bullion doesn't really um, have many changes or identifying marks or anything like that. Is that required to be photographed as well? Um, I, believe it, I believe it is, and, you know, there's good reason for that because oftentimes it is melted down or altered in the state from the time that it is stolen to the time that it's pawned. And so we need to see what it looked like at the time that it was pawned. It, it'll be helpful to um, basically to investigate potential thefts. And again, I believe that pawnbrokers are generally in support of, of us doing what we can to support efforts that would prevent stolen property to be pawned. I, I believe they are too. I think that they want to make sure that everybody gets treated fairly. So thank you for your explanations. I yield. You're welcome. Okay. Now go to Alderman Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to actually that's why I was chiming in to say that I've talked to a couple of pawnbrokers broker, in town. They have no problem with this going through again. So I appreciate the PD staying on top of it and trying to protect the public. Thank you. Okay. Motion on the floor is to approve. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item 45. First reading of ordinance number 6216, an ordinance amending section 5.52.130 of the Rapid City Municipal Code relating to merchant security vehicle identification. And the recommendation is to approve, but we'll first go to Lisa Modric, Alderwoman Modric. Thank you. That mic of mine. That mic of mine. I'd like to make a motion to approve, and if I get a good second, I'd like to retain the floor. Second. Thank you. And if I motion by Modric, second by Drew. Okay. Thank you. And may I ask Chief Jack a question? Absolutely. Thank you, Chief. Um, when the statements were made by the business owners of not being the, having addressed on this, now we've got a letter from November sixth. Was anything sent out to any of the patrols? Um, I I would say that generally the issue. Um, Black Hills Patrol ownership, all three that spoke today, they are aware of our desire to have them make an adjustment to the way their vehicles appear. Um, have they been notified directly from us that this was going to be an ordinance change? No, but that's what the public process is about, and that's why we would have a second reading between tonight and the next council meeting. So. Um, obviously, they've been made aware through that process, and that's how that is supposed to work. So on the financial side, because they do need to prepare to uh, have the vehicles uh, re, uh, redone with the wording design, and it does still need to come towards you for approval once the ordinance is set, how long will they have to, um, before they have to put that expense out to change all of their, their vehicles? From the time of the second reading, I'm going to defer to Joel Landing for the period of the number of days that they have to come into compliance. Thank you. I think at committee this came up, and what we discussed, there wasn't a specific time frame 
but before we would um, take any legal action against anybody, whether it be to file criminal charges or file civil uh, action to make them come into compliance, we'd certainly give them a reasonable amount of time. I don't have a specific number of days. I would probably work with the police department, have them talk to the individual owners and discuss a time frame that everyone could agree with. And I guess if we can't come up with the time frame, then, uh, you know, then come back and ask you for additional time or uh, however you want to handle it. But I don't think in ordinance there is a specific time frame, but we'd certainly want to see them come into compliance as soon as possible. But we understand if you have vehicles that you need to change the markings on and things that it's not going to probably happen the next day. Thank you. And I think that's important because we do need to keep the communication open with the business owners and managers so that they can prepare for this. And it does need to be timely, but we need to also respect their needs for re replacing their fleet with wording that's necessary. One of the things that I would hope that the council would consider on the supporting of this is that the words that are being requested are words that the public needs to see. This is a time that there's a lot of concerns about security and we really are relying on private security more and more I think than ever before and I think that business is going to continue to grow and and I, I just recommend that uh, you know anybody that feels as a business owner or property owner uh, that they want that extra security they should go out for private security and have them manage their properties and make sure that their uh, properties are safe but while you are on the public side, it's difficult even by reading the vehicles now, knowing for sure what we're clearly looking at. And I think the definition of this is clear. It makes it that it is private. That's important probably to the property owner or their customer when they're seeing that it's private security so that it can be respected when that vehicle comes up and uh, action is made on behalf of the property owner by their uh, contracted private security. So I would hope that that's an understanding that we can portray. I, I just appreciate that the chief brought this back. It sounds like it's been going around for 2010, 11, 12. I, I find on council history always repeats itself and it's repeating itself again. But these are words I'd like to see. Um, if I was a woman on a piece on a property and the vehicle came up, I'd want to know that I'm talking to true security and that it's private security so that I um, am not in fear. And I think that's part of the process. So I appreciate that this came before us and I would really thank the private security companies for the work that they're doing in order to enhance the property owners and protect the property owners and the people out there because that's your job and we really appreciate it. And, and so I thank you for that. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right. Next up, Alderman Lorenzi, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair. If I may, I'd like to ask Chief Jagers a question, please. Sure. Thank you. Chief, do we have, I don't see anything attached here, do we have any, I'm just trying to understand the scope of why we need to make the change. I looked at the pictures. I mean, I guess it just, it's a matter of opinion, but to me it's pretty clear it's not a police vehicle. but a city police vehicle or a state police vehicle. But my question to you is, do we have any data that supports why we need to make this change or is it just somebody's opinion? Do we have a lot of situations that we've documented, interactions with citizens and private patrol where there were then later complaints because they assumed that it was city patrol and ended up being private patrol? I'm just trying to understand why. What, what, what's the nexus of this whole change? Over time, we've had concerns regarding um, this specific company operating in non-private property locations. And um, so I think that this change to clarify not only to the public but to their staff that their role as private security is going to be very helpful. So it's a very simple change. The uh, ordinance update is attached and essentially what it's asking is for the word security to be conspicuously located on three sides of their vehicle that's it well what i'm saying though to you is when i'm looking at this vehicle and i guess it gets away from my question is that you're saying over a period of time can you define that for me the problems we've had and can you give me any idea what you're talking about what so, are the problems as they mentioned we've been discussing this to some degree since 2011. So the company has been oppositional to this change. 
Um, it's been requested that they do this. They've opposed that. And so that's why we're to this point that what we're trying to do is we're trying to regulate them through the city ordinance to require the change so that it occurs. Understood, but I still, you're not answering my question. I'm trying to find out what has, has occurred and how often has it occurred where this has been an issue. And we don't have anything in front of us. We're just being told that this is necessary. But I don't make decisions based on sure. just no data. I don't like to, at least. Right. It, I mean, it has, it, it, it has been confusing to members of the public regarding whether Black Hills Patrol is, is a law enforcement organization or a security organization. And that, that's just a general, general feeling that has occurred by some over time. But we and don't have anything documented, the number of situations where this has been become an issue. Yes or no? We don't have documentation to this, right? I can tell you that we've had numerous issues where they've been engaging in activity on off-contract locations. And so this essentially is going to tighten up the clarity of their role in our community. So how many of these situations would you say we had in the last five years that you're describing? Several. This ballpark. Several. Eight? Five six? To ten, five to ten. Five to ten. So one to two a year, maybe. Um, is there any other recourse other than, I'm looking at the pictures, I mean, to me, and I don't know if the rest of the councils looked at these pictures, but it doesn't say security, it says private patrol. They have private patrol, I think, on two or three sides of it. At least I think it's the same on the other side. Mm -hmm. To me, it's clear, and that's the problem I'm having, is I don't understand why this is an issue, and one to two times a year, is there other things we could do instead? of having them go through the cost of rebranding their vehicles. Is there, I mean, if the, is there a violation of the ordinance? So, but this was going to create a violation, right? Oh, That's what we're doing. So there are other things. I have wor worked with Mr. Rorak in the past. He has uh, made change to their internal policies, which has been very helpful. Um, I think that this, um, if you look at the ordinance as it currently reads, it. Um, it currently states vehicles used in any emergency security activity operation must also be distinctly marked and uniform to the license operating vehicles and distinguished from markings of any city police force vehicles or vehicles of any other established mer merchant security. So um, I believe that currently we are, we are not operating under the spirit of the way the ordinance is written. That's why I've gone to their company. I've asked for them to voluntarily change and they have been unwilling to do so and um, Mr. Orak is a former attorney I'll just tell you that he's been somewhat difficult to deal with on this issue and so I think the only way that we're going to get this accomplished is to um, require them to do it. Yeah I mean you know Chief I, I appreciate that I usually have your back on almost all issues the problem I'm having is that I feel like we have a huge problem, but the, what I'm wondering is if we're saying to them, we're, we've already said to them that the problem is that they're sometimes patrolling in areas they don't belong. Alderman Lorenzi, I'm sorry. So how I, would that change I, I, this? I don't understand how that would change yeah. the problem, but anyway. Maybe, uh, maybe the next council member might pose that question. Alderman Drury, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. May I ask a question to Chief Jagers, please? Absolutely. Chief, I also see that we have a letter here from the Highway Patrol, South Dakota State Highway Patrol. Where, how did that develop? How did that letter come about in support of your ordinance, of the ordinance? Through a discussion be, uh, with Captain Ketterling and I regarding this concern, and so um, as you can see, they're, in their interest, they would like to also have private um, security companies marked distinguishably different than, um, than law enforcement. So if you look at the vehicles and the pictures attached, you'll see that the Black Hills Patrol emblem, symbolism, narrative is somewhat of a cross between the South Dakota Highway Patrol and federal law enforcement, um, federal um, forest service. So I think that's where the confusion comes into play. We have a lot of tourists that come in 
um, especially during the summer months. And as you see these vehicles going from one contract location to another contract location, um, I think it could be easily confusing for the public. And so a member of the public might be in a position that they might flag them down or expect service from them that they would expect from law enforcement, but it wouldn't be appropriate for the private security to provide that service. Okay. Thank you, Chief. I yield. Okay. Alderman Lewis. Maybe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as, Ms. as Mr. Excuse me, Chief Jaggers pointed out, this is only the first reading, so we do have uh, another stop at legal and finance, and then it'll be back to us again. So if there's any other questions, I think some of these concerns, maybe we can address them with either, you know, amongst the concerned parties. I mean, rather than hashing it out too much tonight, if we, if we still have plenty of time to do that, if everybody's interested in doing that, um, or asking the, a lot of the questions you don't have to necessarily ask up here you can ask or contact, I'm sure they'd be willing to, to talk with you about that. Okay, the motion on the floor is to approve. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Two no's from Laurenti and Roberts. Motion passes. Item number 46, first reading of ordinance number 6212, an ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. A request by City of Rapid City for a rezoning from no use district to general agricultural district for property generally described as being located southwest of East Highway 44, east of South Valley Drive, and the recommendation is to approve. Uh, motion to approve by Nordstrom, second by Drew. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Friday number 47, we're going to go to Public Works Chair Darla Drew. Thank you, Mr. President. Item number 47, appeal of denied exception request by Prairie Valley Development Company, LLC, to waive the requirement to construct a 12-inch diameter water main in Anderson Road. This item was continued from December 4th, 2017, the City Council meeting, and um, by request of the applicant, and is to be continued again till, uh, to uh, January 2nd. Second. No, okay. Move to approve, yeah. Okay, got a motion by Drew and a second by Lewis to continue this item to January 2nd. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Item number 48, under staff items, a presentation of referral petitions and request to set aside associated special election for Tuesday, February 20th, 2018. Uh, we, but stand by, we got Alderwoman Armstrong in the queue. <laughs> I have a, a question for Pauline, may I? Sure. Um, I am just wondering how much this will cost the um, Rapid City taxpayers. Sure. Uh, can I step back and actually present a little bit of the report on the petitions? So need to do. Thank yes, you. Yes, please. Just, just to make it official. Yes. Um, as Ms. Weaver said, we did have enough signatures turned in. Um, after going through and validating the signatures, there were 2,387 that were um, valid signatures. That is more than the 2,249 that we needed based on um, the 5% of the general election. So we do have to have a special election. Um, I'm requesting that it would be set for February 20th. The county auditor's office has d um, indicated that they can work with that. Joel is currently working on the language for the ballot, so that way we can get that to them by their deadline. Um, as far as answering your question, I can't tell you specifically how much this one is going to cost. The county does do our elections for us. That's a contract that we signed not that long ago. Um, knowing that we didn't have any uh, municipal election in 2018 we, in case we needed one for a special election. The last special election that we had was in 2015 on the Civic Center issue, and that cost over $60,000. Okay, thank you. Okay. Alderman Lewis. Motion to approve, please. Motion by Lewis, second by Roberts. I see nobody else in the queue. All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carries. We now go to our public hearing items, items 49 through 54, an open public hearing, excuse me, open comments for public hearing, items 49 through 54. I do have one request here for Tony Marshall for item 54. Or excuse me. Tony, 
Yep, we're going to 54 on this one. Well, item 54. Tony, go ahead. You have yes, three please. Thank you, Council. Tony Marshall. May I use this? Sure thing. Thank you, Council members. There's a few of you that I haven't uh, spoken to on this uh, matter yet, but I heard some great conversation tonight regarding development. I heard develop the right way, grow it right, I heard, and uh, frankly, I agree. And I believe the right way for Rapid City to grow is to develop infill pockets, these vacant parcels of land that exist in our community. There's a lot of them. Uh, some of them, frankly, shouldn't can't be developed and perhaps should be developed, uh, but there's some that should be developed, okay? Uh, and there's reasons why there's a lot of these pockets within our community that aren't developed. Uh, they all have various issues uh, that I think require some flexibility when it comes to uh, what the city requires of us developers. Go to this. How do I draw on this? This is the site. Oh, teleprompter. One is for me. Thank you. This is the site that I'm seeking to develop. And the right of way is just to the left of that. That's the Fairmont Boulevard right of way. You can see that this project right here, where the assisted living facility is, and the current alignment developed, currently developed Fairmont Boulevard followed, in my opinion, a failed uh, major street plan. The major street plan is certainly not perfect given uh, the topographical issues that we face in this community in building roads. I think this was clearly a failure on, on part of the major street plan. Well, Fairmont Boulevard, the current constructed part was was built based on that particular, and again, in my opinion, failed design. Why? Because you have Fairmont Boulevard is slated to cross th this section and would be improved with a bridge that is uh, about 500 feet long. And my engineer, Cale McNaboas Berlick, uh, admittedly is not a bridge designer, but uh, he estimated that this bridge would cost about six million bucks, okay? When there currently already is this bridge across Tower Road, okay, which with a bridge deck of 200 feet. Mr. Marshall, what we might do is when we get to your items, we might call you back up. To Thank, Thank you for further explaining. I have a few more things to add. Okay. All right, we're going to, uh, excuse me, turn my page. Consent public hearing on us 49 through 51. and. Council okay, oh excuse me, we got uh, 49 we need to make a change on, so let me read that in here. Youth and Family Services for a special event, Malt Beverage, is there a change to that from staff? I'm trying to recall. Mm -hmm. Pauline, can you explain that? You bet, we're notified today that the addresses that they had listed on the application are not the addresses in which the event will be taking place. So we will need to table this item and then at the next council meeting we'll set a hearing date for the correct location and then the second meeting in January we'll actually have the, the hearing. Okay. So, Got a motion by Lewis, a second by Roberts to continue that to... No, to t just to table this one. Just to table this item for a future date. All right. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. The rest of the consent items 50 through 51. Do I have a motion to approve? All right. We got a motion by Lorenzi, second by Drury. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. That takes us to the end of the consent public hearing calendar. Now we're on to the non-consent public hearing items 52 through 54. Item number 52, a second reading of ordinance number 
an ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapsi Municipal Code. A request by KTM Design Solutions, Inc. for Storage Place, Inc. for a rezoning from no use district to office commercial district for property generally described as being located southwest of the intersection of Dunsmore Road and Port Rush Road. And the recommendation is to approve in conjunction with a planned development designation. All right, we got a, mo a motion by Robert, second by Lorenzi. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item 53, second reading, ordinance number 6211, an ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by KTM Design Solutions, Inc. for Dean Ham Trust for rezoning from no use district to low density residential district two for property generally described as being located southeast of the intersection of Mirfield Drive and Port Rush Road, and the recommendation is to approve. Got a motion by Lewis, second by Drury. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item 54, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, approve the request by Sperlick Consulting, Inc. for Tony Marshall to consider an application for a vacation of right-of-way for property generally described as being located northeast of the intersection of Fairmont Boulevard and Tower Road. And we will now go to Alderwoman Modric. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the request to uh, vacate the uh, right-of-way of this uh, bridge area, and if I can get a second, I'd like to retain the floor. Thank you. And a motion by Modric and a second by Lewis. Thank you. There was, uh, again, great discussion regarding this particular parcel. Uh, we complimented Mr. Marshall and his creative designs that he does in infill. That's something that the uh, City of Rapid City and its departments and its council would love to see more infill done with the pockets that we have left. This will be a desirable location, so it's an excellent opportunity for more housing to go in an area that's close to downtown, and um, that's an improvement for us. This particular design, if you go back, and you can actually Google it back years, like I think I went back to 2000, and it goes even before that, I believe, but this bridge to nowhere has been penciled in for a very long time. There was nothing developed at the time, and um, the village at Skyline Pines, it was approved to develop and to uh, uh, create the facility that it has. It has some other things that plan on going around there, but it did so with the design that we currently have on, Fair, on uh, Fairmont Boulevard. And there is also Pevins Parkway. I don't know what development's gonna go in there. None of us know with our crystal ball, but you can see that Pevins Parkway at some point has development opportunities that could be designed as another outway at some point, especially if Village at Skyline Pine grows. But we're talking about the other side of the gully, the other side of Comfort Inn and that gully or that gulch that's there. Uh, the bridge is keeping, or the thought of a bridge is keeping anything from happening. So if we remove the bridge to nowhere and allow this proposed subdivision to proceed forward, we will have more housing, we'll have, uh, we'll have property taxes, we'll have things happening that we need to have. The bridge was enhanced by the DOT during the Mount Rushmore Road Project. Um, and stabilized, so it has had some upgrades. There is some development as well that is planned, commercial and also a residential. Up Tower Road, you still have Skyline Drive, you still have um, Heavens Parkway to get out as well as to the, um, to the service road. You have several different options as far as your driving capabilities. This subdivision is right at the entrance of the bridge and out, so it really has a pretty clean exit uh, from that direction if needed. So this is a bridge to nowhere. It's been there for a long time. This is the time to vacate it. It's the time to remove it so that these lands can be built on. It's been a, uh, 18 years. It'll be another 18 years if we don't uh, clean this map up and allow progress. So I am in favor of the motion of which I've made, and I hope that our council will go forward with that and let's build some housing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now go to our uh, planning community planning director, Ken Young. Thank you. I'd like to go over and uh, use the projector over there for Got a little it. presentation.
Okay, I wanted to take uh, the opportunity to uh, give some explanations uh, that may support reasoning of staff and the unanimous vote by Planning Commission to deny this request. Uh, we do have uh, several concerns uh, related to this and out of order, excuse me, point of order, we are, this is not, the staff has not been asked a question, they don't, we don't normally have to present on an item from the public. Chair, to give them permission as we do with the other <coughs> But staff. there's no direct question asked them. Okay, would anybody like to ask him a question? I can certainly ask him. I, the only way you can. I can certainly ask him. All right, Mr. Nordstrom. Do you have the floor? Mr. Young, um, you, you started the presentation and I wanted to follow up anyway with, your, uh, with a question about the vacation of the right way. And uh, a little bit more, I've been reading through the notes that was through the uh, um, project report on the vacation of the right of way and that's my major concern right now. So could you address that for us please? Okay, so the request to vacate the right of way. Um, Mr. Young, just I apologize. Uh, just uh, be aware that I've only got five minutes, and okay. now it's down 4.30, so just be aware. All right. All right. Okay. So we're talking about uh, just a narrow piece of, of ground, uh, or, yeah, above ground, if you will, where a bridge is proposed to go in. Uh, it's not so much an, uh, a concern over that particular ground or whether that should be uh, a right-of-way that should move forward. It's uh, what we have seen is an issue that regards this property here with 101 patient rooms. We have 82 rooms here of uh, the hotel. We've got uh, an employer here with uh, 260 plus uh, employees needing to access. We've got a restaurant. We've got a vacant property uh, that will develop. We have the potential for additional development uh, and new expansion there. All of this feeding onto one roadway with one access. And so I think really what we're looking at is the need for a secondary access, a concern that if we get that up without having a plan for another access, that we may be shooting ourselves in the foot safety-wise into the future. Uh, if we do give up this area right here, then uh, we still re have only one point of access, which if we ended up with a problem at the intersection of uh, Highway 16, uh, then where would all of these people uh, go out? We've got some issues up here. Uh, potentially, uh, another access could come out that way, but there are some topographical issues there. There's also potential that we route an access to come over this way. That might be a better uh, access as well. So it's not really a concern over the Brielle subdivision and their access because there are options for them to go up the hill this way. However, it's these, the concern lies with the development that the city has already approved and should take care of and should provide secondary access for. And so it, it has been the recommendation that we don't give up right away until we have a good plan to replace that, which we don't have at this time. Mr. Young, thank you very much for that. Um, my major concern is giving up the right of way. And if we did have to give up, if we, this council chooses to give up that right away or narrows it down, that creates an issue for the city in the future. And who, again, who's going to pay for that uh, re retention of that right away or getting that right away back to the, the, uh, the city for future development? I don't recall seeing anything anywhere about we have to put it a bridge in right now if we did not do this uh, right away, retain, retention, because we've done re uh, retentions of right of ways in other areas of town, so I'm not just not eager to give this right away up. So um, that's my major concern is going along with not putting a bridge in, but a being, being able to retain the right of way in there. So if, if you got any follow up on that, I'd be interested in hearing that. Well, just the, the mere fact that uh, if we don't have another plan in place, we should retain what we do have until we can replace it. Uh, there is a very substantial need for secondary access for this development area. Uh, we might be hurting ourselves if we don't make a plan for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll yield. Okay, go to Alderman Roberts. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I would like to make a substitute motion. I think I can make a substitute motion on the top of this. That we uh, do not approve the request of the vacation of the right-of-way, but we do make a stipulation that Mr. Marshall or his development does not have to participate in any of the cost of the bridge. If I can get a second. All right, will you restate that motion for all of us, please? <laughs> we, we are not going to approve the request of the vacation of the right-of-way, but we are going to make a stipulation that Mr. Marshall will not have to participate in any of the cost of the bridge. What's that? We are not. Mr. Marshall? Do I, can I ask you a question? Who was the second on that? Me. Okay. You, you said in the public works meeting that you can do this project without giving up the vacation of the right-of-way, correct? I did say that at the public works meeting. So is this palatable to you? Um, I guess that's my question. Do you want us to go forward on this vote? It's... Uh, it, It's still not palatable to have this development next to a potential bridge. I mean, what comes along with, in the past, with waving, uh, improving a street is warps. Yes, we, we don't, don't do the, warp anymore. We don't do warps anymore. You either get a variance or... What I'd like to focus on, and I expected nothing less from our community planning director than to, to speak to what he did on this project, but I think it's up to you guys to look at this practically speaking and say, how much sense does it make for the taxpayers? Because we've already I, I, tonight. I agree with you there, Tony. Let, let me tell you my thought by doing it this way, okay? I don't believe that there's a chance in hell this bridge is ever going to get built. So I really don't think that your subdivision has to worry about it. Because the only way it's ever going to get built is with the CIB, CIP project. If you, you have no responsibility in it, and we're 50 years behind on CIP projects. How much do you think this is going to raise to the top of those CIP projects? It's not. So, you know, my suggestion to you is if you do this subdivision and we do leave this right away here, come in in a few years and ask for it to be vacated because we probably will do it at that time. But I don't see the council being palatable enough at this moment to give you the vacation of the right way, which would be the smart thing to do, but that's the reason I came back here, because I think we can get them to vote to give you, you know, you have to give up the, the right away, but, you know, you're rolling the dice. Maybe we'll put the bridge in. If all of a sudden we have $100 million next year or two, maybe we will do it, but I doubt it. So anyway, I'm bought out of time, so. I appreciate that you being flexible, just as I asked on these infill projects, it takes some flexibility. I only was appealing to common sense on uh, providing a $6 million bridge, spending $6 million of taxpayers' money. So who's going who's to pay for this? The taxpayers are going to pay for this. And there is a viable second alternative to for access, uh, ultimately through, you don't have public right-of-way to it, but... Tony, you got one minute of Alderman Roberts' time. You have so time? You. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, one minute. Because Mr. Solomon uh, mentioned the issue of safety in the, in, the, in the past, but this alignment for secondary access makes a heck of a lot more sense than building a $6, $6 million bridge, which undoubtedly is going to come out of the taxpayer's pocket. I agree with that. And I've seen very many, many very bad road alignments since I've been on the council. And this one, I think, has got to really raise to one of the top of them. So Put it back you. on the tax rules. Let's pay property taxes on that land. Thank you. Thank you. You done? All right. <laughs> I know. Mr. Lorenzi, you have the floor, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. And if I may, I'd like to ask Mr. Young a question, if I can. Sure. Given this substitute motion, Mr. Young, how does that work uh, from your standpoint? Uh, well, I think what we will, will hope to achieve eventually is uh, 
with the, the feelings that have been expressed in this, these motions being made, that we will be able to come up with an alternate route for access into that development to the north. Uh, I don't know that we have uh, ever strictly or uh, strongly defended the, the need or the purpose for a bridge. The bridge itself is not the issue. Right. It's access. Correct. So do you think that's something that will be able to be worked out for this development? I'd like to see the development happen because it's in Phil as well. So do you see that as a realistic? We're, we're all for the development and we'd love to see Agreed. that go Agreed. forward with uh, another plan for access. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, we now go to Alderman Modric with the one minute, 50 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Young, um, I love the statement you just made because I think there is other access points that are going to come about. We do have the village at Silent Pines that has uh, other phases that are coming. They have villas that are coming. We've got, uh, like you said, the restaurants, some other places that have room for expansion, including that Pevens Parkway land that at some point will become a development. It's becoming prime now, so it's probably reaching close to its time. But at this point, if there's development requests going on, let's say for village at Skyline Pines with their villas, their phase two and phase three and phase four that they've got coming up, will they have to call in that bridge at that time since it's a vacation of right away uh, that it hasn't happened? Well, I mean, what, what happens to them then? Or will they be denied their phases uh, because of what you're discussing now? No, as it has been originally approved, uh, it was based on the access that was uh, given. Uh, so there would be no uh, requirement for bridge, bridge building at that point. Uh, however, the need for access becomes stronger and a greater issue. It does, and I think that is another reason why my original motion was what, you, what it was. This is a great time to vacate that and get it off the books and move forward. So I respect the motion, the substitute motion that's on here because I want this development to happen. Um, I think it would have a, a stronger appeal if it had a vacated right of way and let's, you know, let's build it right that way. So thank you. Okay, so the motion on the floor, nobody else is in the speaker queue, is are we saying not approve the request for the right of way? Is that what we're saying? But not hold Mr. Marshall uh, responsible for, part for participating in the cost of a future potential bridge. Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed. The motion carries. Do we have a motion to go into executive session? We got a motion by Drew, second by Drury. All in favor? Aye. All right, we're in executive session.
Second. Motion by Lewis to come out of executive session. Second by Lorenzi. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, next item on the agenda is staff direction regarding EPIC Outdoor Advertising versus Rapid City Zoning Board of Adjustment. Steve, Steve Lorenzi, you have the floor, sir. I think I make a motion to direct the attorney's office to uh, appeal the circuit court's decision. Second. I've got a motion by Lorenzi and a second by Drury. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. We got, Lew well, was it Lewis and Roberts? Okay. Do you want to take a roll call? Let's do it. Roll call vote, please. The motion is to authorize staff to appeal uh, appeal the case. Thank you. The circuit court decision. And we're going to a roll call. Nordstrom. Modric. Jason, you don't vote, right? You can? Okay, sorry. Solomon? Aye. Lewis? Armstrong? Aye. Laurenti? Drury? Aye. Roberts? No. Drew? Aye. Vote passes 7 to 2. Okay. Vote passes 7 to 2. We are now going to the bill list for December 18, 2017. And Finance Officer Pauline Sumption. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There are no additions to the bill list, so the total is that which is attached at six million four hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred sixteen dollars and ninety-two cents. We got a motion by Lorenzi, second by Lewis. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed. Move to adjourn. Lorenzi, second by Lewis to adjourn. All in favor. Aye. All opposed. Aye. <laughs> we are adjourned. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas.